Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Hi, hey, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And I'm very pleased to welcome today Nicola Johnstone uh, to be speaking about how oral histories benefit the planning and management of MPAs. For those of you who are here uh, several weeks ago, back in December, we're, uh, we were sorry about the problems and we're very glad that you were able to rejoin us. And for those who are newly able to join us, we're glad we were able to reschedule and um, you are able to join us now. Um, before we get started, and I turn this over to Nicola, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So we'll have a set, time, set presentation and then there'll be time at the end for question and answer. We encourage you to send in any questions you have, um, even while you're listening to the webinar. You can put questions into the question panel of the user interface or in the chat. Uh, the, question, uh, uh, the question panel is a little easier to moderate, so um, that's wonderful. It, the, if you have something that you're interested in feedback from others in the um, who are attending the webinar, however, then it's, it's a great thing to put that in the chat and make it available to, to everyone. You can send it to everyone and then other people are able to respond. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat um, to share resources that are uh, on this topic or to respond to questions from Nicola or others. We just ask that you keep the um, all, all chats in the chat um, professional and on this topic. Um, and thank you for everyone for attending and I'll turn it over to Nicola now. Thanks very much, Sarah. I'm really excited to be sharing my uh, project with you. Hopefully you can hear me. You'll let me know if you can't. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, yeah, I'll be sharing how oral histories benefit the planning and management of marine protected areas. I would like to start with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we meet on today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So I'm joining from beautiful Goombangir country, which is in northern New South Wales, Australia, on the east coast. I acknowledge the First Nations people joining us today. So my presentation... Oh, Nicole, if I could interrupt you for just a moment, I apologize. I did not. Um, I did want to also let people know that this is coming out of your PhD work um, from Southern Cross University and let people know that you're currently the principal uh, for Im impact management and learning at the Mindaroo Foundation. So I'm sorry I, I neglected to mention that before. No problems. Thanks. Yeah, it was um, yeah a, a very long PhD, and I'm I'm super excited to to share my findings. And so the the context uh, I'll, yeah, today I'll run through a bit of the context of the uh, of my PhD and my project, uh, a bit about the methodology, but spend most of my time uh, looking at the benefits of oral histories and sharing that with you, and also just a few slides at the end about key tips and lessons learned if anyone's going to uh, embark on oral histories. So a bit about the, the context of the project. So it was uh, back in about 2008, so I was a manager of the Solitary Islands Marine Park and we were going through a review of management and we were uh, sitting with like community. If you, could, if you could slow down just just a, a little bit. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we were um, yeah, discussing the management of the uh, marine protected area and people were reminiscing about the good old days and we thought we've really got to capture this information so really that that sparked the idea of of uh, an oral history project uh, and it was the oldest marine protected area in new south wales so it was really um worthy of of, of uh you know understanding the the history to the marine protected area but also my experiences as a, a marine park manager you know I, I knew a lot of people and the community and i, I spend most of my time in the ocean or next to the ocean as part of, you know, with my family and, and my community. Um, but also in my workplace, I really, I, so I was, um, I've been, I was with fisheries for 23 years working in oceans management in marine protected areas and also um, marine strategy after that. But I really understood that we, we spent a lot of time um, and, and resources on understanding the natural 
sciences, but we didn't put a lot of um, time and effort into understanding the human element. Uh, so that was really another motivating factor for this research. And this, this quote really sums it up quite nicely in that natural sciences can inform us about the natural environment and people's actions within it, but it's the people's choices that are values-driven and need to be understood. So the lo location of the Solitary Islands Marine Park, so it's on the east coast of Australia. If anyone knows Byron Bay, we're about two hours south of Byron Bay, or um, another explanation is sort of halfway between Brisbane and Sydney. Uh, but the Solitary Islands Marine Park, the defining features are the five solitary islands. Uh, it, it's one of the largest marine parks in New South Wales, so it's 72,000 hectares. It extends out to the three nautical mile limits state of state waters and uh, up the estuaries to the tidal limits uh, and also to the mean high water mark along the foreshores. Uh, it's generally less than 50 metres in depth, so it's not super deep, uh, other than on the um, eastern side of some of the offshore islands, it does get a bit deeper. And it's this amazing place where you've got this mix of subtropical and temperate species. So, you know, those fish coming down from the Great Barrier Reef and some of the cooler species um, from, from the south really sort of intermingle in, in this really special place. Uh, water temperature can be anywhere between 16 degrees in winter to 27 degrees in summer further offshore. Again, that the, the warmer water is influenced by that East Australian current coming down the coast from the Great Barrier Reef. Very biologically diverse, uh, 550 species of reef fish, 90 species of coral, uh, 90 species of mollusk, and the, these stats are probably outdated now. There's probably more uh, to add to, to the list. Uh, but it, yeah, importantly, it was um, the, the islands or the, the solitary isles was named by Lieutenant James Cook, who passed these solitary isles on the 15th of May, 1770, on a very bleak day. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of history to the area. So the context of what is what is a marine protected area I won't spend too much time on this because I'm presuming that you all have a fairly good idea uh, but they as you know they can be I won't talk about the definition but it's um, but they can be called many things as you're also maybe aware marine park marine reserve marine sanctuary marine management area no take area etc in New South Wales um, yeah they're marine parks and they are multiple use and the primary purpose is to conserve the biological diversity and man maintain ecosystem integrity and ecosystem function of the bioregions in the marine estate, first and foremost. And then the secondary purpose, um, providing for the management and use of resources, scientific research, cultural use and opportunities for public appreciation and enjoyment. And so what is an oral history? Um, so. Again, there's a number of definitions, uh, and this is a quite a succinct one. It's really it's a way of collecting and interpret, interpreting human memories to foster knowledge and human dignity. And some common components of an oral history is it's really you're relying on memory. Uh, it generally involves a recorded interview between the researcher and the participant. It requires informed consent. Uh, it's a conversation based around pre-planned questions or themes, uh, involves the researcher inspiring that act of remembering, uh, historical in intent to seek new knowledge about the past, uh, interpreted to look for underlying patterns of meaning, and a recorded, archived and made accessible for others to use in future. And, and that's a key component of oral history. So those recordings can be used by others and interpreted in, in other ways for other projects. So that information is available long-term. So my project, uh, the methodology, really it was, um, it was, yeah, I can't remember when I actually started now, but it was, I finished in 2016, here, here we go, conducted between May 2012 to September 2016. So yeah, there was, it was, it, it took time. There was 65 semi-structured interviews with 70 people. So that's, that's fairly ambitious. Uh, four of those were a couple, so that's a husband and wife, and another couple were, were, were two sisters, two um, Gumbangir elders, 
uh, sisters that were very generous with their time. So overall, there was only 11 females in those 70 people interviewed. It, it, it was more difficult to find women who um, who were willing to, to participate. Uh, and so five of those were individual interviews, 11 uh, sorry, of the 11, and the others were part of the, the couples. The approximate age were uh, anywhere between 40 and 90. They were generally about the 70 years of age bracket area. Um, I, I say 40 because there was there was one younger person, but generally the age was, um, you know, it was that lived experience that we were looking at. There were very diverse in interests in terms of there were surfers, divers, Aboriginal elders, um, fishermen, etc. So it was really trying to get those very diverse interests and perspectives and memories and experiences and spatially spread from the north of the Marine Park to the south of the Marine Park. And I did travel to um, to talk to some pretty key people. Uh, I did, went to Townsville and also somewhere else in Queensland to talk to some key characters in the story of the Solitary Islands Marine Park. Uh, I developed 10 questions uh, based around three broad themes the, around, first of all, experiences and then sharing experiences, also about the, the park features and changes they've noticed over time and also their views on management. So uh, the actual interview and analysis it was an iterative approach. So during interviews, um, we could respond to highlights I will I'll, I'll note that I conducted, I think was, I did about 59 of the interviews um, and I had a couple of colleagues help out in some of the very early interviews. But there was this iterative approach um, mentioned when it was conducted, contacted uh, most in advance, invited their participation. Uh, there were people that we knew through managing the Solitary Islands Marine Park. So we had a good list of about 40 straight up who were very keen to participate. And then at interview, we would ask, uh, is anyone else, is there anyone else we should be interviewing the snowball sampling technique? Uh, so there was no sh shortage of people and we didn't have to advertise. It was, it was, we had to sort of just cut it at one point in time. It was just, it was too many people. Um, most interviews were conducted at a residence. Uh, it was up to the participant, but at their residence, they were fairly comfortable. Uh, there was quite a number at the Marine Park office in a quiet place. Uh, we also went to Yarrawarra Aboriginal Corporation as well for a number of them in a beautiful setting uh, and uh, also went to a nursing home. Uh, I was also in a surfboard shaper's factory as well interviewing him. Uh, most interviews were about a couple of hours in length. A few of them were three hours. A few were fairly short. So it was it was just yeah going, not really knowing how long you'll be there, but just in, you know really immersed in the in the stories. Um, important to have the consent form to release the use of the information and photos if you collected them. Uh, video and voice record. So I did. I take I took a video in and asked their permission to video as well as a voice recorder. Uh, as, as a backup, and that was also easier to transcribe, but having both was was useful. There was only one person that asked not to be on video, just a very quiet, shy person. Uh, and the uh, the voice recording was transcribed and the transcript was uh, checked by the participant. And that was if to ensure that spelling of names were correct or if we missed a word. Uh, yeah, it was just to ensure that they, they could help us sort of co-create that narrative. Uh, and NVivo software was used to code and sort the data. So what are the benefits of oral histories? Um, just moving this along. So the, the first benefit was being able to tell the evolution of the marine park, uh, such an iconic marine park and the oldest in New South Wales. But it helped identify the key characters in the community. It was, it was really driven by these passionate people who wanted protection of the marine park or, or protection of this special area. Um, it also really unearthed, you know, how and why the marine protected area mattered to people um, and also an interesting story about how it shaped the lives of some of the um, most prominent marine scientists globally. Uh, and I'll talk about Charlie Veron, who you may know is, is one of the leading coral scientists. Uh, yeah, and so he, he really cut his teeth in the Solitary Islands Marine Park. Uh, it also was a, a place for people to share their emotions and frustrations um, about management. 
in a non-confrontational setting. So I was the manager at the time and people were sharing really quite frankly how they felt about the evolution of the park and how it may have impacted or not impacted or, you know, just their 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 role in, in management. I, I also unearthed the political influences were ever present and that's probably across the board in any marine protected area. It's just, and it was, it was quite an interesting sort of political journey as well. Uh, it was, as I mentioned, documenting this park for the first time uh, through people's memories um, gave new insights uh, in that the marine park was really, it was developed through this lens of a, a threat-based approach. You know, the, the community were motivated. They could see threats to this, this special area and they were really um, agitating to have it protected and in I know, certainly in Australia, we moved to this um, car system, comprehensive adequate representative uh, policies that were guiding um, protection, as as you may be aware. Uh, and New South Wales have since again moved to this threats based approach. So it was, it was sort of forgotten that really this first marine park was that threats driven approach. Uh, before we moved to that, um, the uh, sort of that target setting approach. Uh, it also able to identify the, the absence of voices in the marine protected area management process and in particular uh, First Nations people. And I did interview, uh, there was I think there was about 12 um, elders and, um, I, and asked all the same questions, but that really didn't come through in, in the interview, the impact of the, the management or the their involvement in the management and I, I know they were involved because I was as part of the latter end of the process not the early but yeah it was, really wasn't something that they um, they communicated but certainly were very active um, and a lot of themes coming through in the rest of the presentation also conscious of time uh, so the I won't unpack this it'll, it'll take quite some time but really what it highlights that 1969 was the start of the whole thing and it was 1998 that the marine park itself was declared so it was it was a very long journey and interestingly it was uh, the world spearfishing championships were announced for the area uh, and they were in 1969 to be conducted in 71 and that really um, motivated key people like john rota to um to you know share you know how special the marine park is, as is and agitate for protection and it was sort of a similar theme along that timeline that there was different people different actors that came in to um to help push for protection the championships didn't go ahead but then they were proposed again um i think 1975 they were proposed for 77 but they didn't go ahead so it was interesting that this this world spear fishing competition really um the proposal resulted in this area being protected uh, among other threats that evolved through like aquarium collection, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it, it's a pretty interesting journey and I, I, I wouldn't be able to spend time sort of going through it in any sort of detail. But 1991 is when there was a Marine Reserve gazetted. So it was um, there was some protection put in place in 1991 in earnest, uh, but the community weren't happy with that. That wasn't enough. It didn't, uh, wasn't protective enough. So they... Uh, continued to agitate and in 1998 we had the, uh, the marine park and that's still in place today so yeah it, there's, a, there's a very lovely story uh told through many people um, as part of my PhD so uh, just a, a couple of extracts from that evolution chapter um, so this is Charlie Veron um so he he's written you know the the corals of the world um books um, but he uh, he was actually studying marine worms oh he's actually studying dragonflies before marine worms and it was the the they started up the dive club in the university of new england which is a couple of a few hours inland uh, and so this is john rota the first person really that started pushing for the marine park he said i i think it coral discovery was leaked to the underwater club at the university of New England. And so Charlie Veron got in touch with me about doing some research in the Solitaries region. And that was in 1971. So um, yeah, and that really shifted his career. He then on, went on to establish the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And he's he's been one of the advisors to um, 
David Attenborough, you know, so he's, he's a really prominent person and he he was, and he even going through the interview, it was that realisation that really, you know, that was the start of the whole thing for him, <laughs> and, you know, shifted, shifting his career. Another extract from the evolution chapter was that um, Bob Howard, my good friend, I, um, I met, he was my first interview and I met him when my son, who was on the left, was one year old. So that's the beauty of these oral history projects in that you get to meet these beautiful people. So Bob was the commercial fishing representative on our advisory committee. And so he, his recollections was, you know, so when they first came up with the marine parks, everybody hated Yaz, was his words. Um, probably had reason to in some things, but people didn't understand. But we, when you get around and meet people, 95% of the people accepted what was happening or what happened and I think 95% of the people are pleased it happened, but there's not enough publicity goes into it. So these, it's just the very tip of the iceberg of these amazing stories and memories and views on, on the park and its evolution. And Bob was instrumental in, um, in that story, uh, not only representing commercial fishers, but he really, he was a champion for marine protected areas as well. Uh, so another benefit was really understanding the connections and values people have with a marine protected area and their motivations and actions to protect it. It also helped to build those relationships and trust with the local people. And it was that safe environment to share deeply personal stories as well um, and understand sort of individual meanings uh, and meanings of shared experiences in the park. So, you know, for example, what it would mean to me, but also what it, meaning associated with um, a, a place with me and my family perhaps in this shared experience but interestingly it also highlighted the shared meaning of an individual experience from different people leaving vastly different lives which I'll talk to in a minute so um, and that was through this relational values approach and there was eight groupings identified and I know we, we we've often talked about the that stakeholders and we consult with stakeholders and that might be talking to commercial, uh, commercial fishermen and then, then you might be talking to research scientists etc in their their interest groups or stakeholder groups but this highlighted that really um, those people that we think are quite siloed um, really have a, a lot more in in common through their values so just to give an example, so when I asked the question in interview, you know, what does the Solar Trailers Mean Park mean to you? Uh, in this particular va relational values approach, um, challenge was one that came to the fore. Uh, for example, Rob Toyer, who's a prawn trawl fisherman, uh, and this was his, his words, you know, love the water, you know, what I've got from the sea, from a life at sea, every day at sea is different. Every day you go to work as a fisherman is a challenge and it's a challenge against the environment you work in and it's a challenge against the particular animal you're hunting. And throughout his uh, interview, it was, he really referred to challenges, the challenges of putting out a fire in the engine of the boat, uh, the challenge of, you know, re rewriting um, the, the boat when it was tipping over, going through the bar. So, but he loved that challenge. And then Ian Shaw, who's uh, one of the divers and part of the Solitary Islands Underwater Research Group, for him, it was also the challenge. And it was doing something in it or wishing I was doing something in it every day. I find the challenge of getting more underwater photos for the marine park inventory, for the surge inventory, that's a real driving force in my life and to get out there and to get as many species as I can. And he too talked about challenges, but in a, in a very different sense. And David Tarrant, a shell collector, um, similar in terms of challenge surprises, and he's written a book on cowries. So, yeah, very prominent shell expert. And for him, it was, it was I guess it's full of surprises. I just enjoy the ocean because I grew up on the ocean. And from when I was nine, I enjoyed the odd cyclone, you know, just because of what it does and what it changes and what it might wash up. So it was something you don't really expect when um, you're asking, what does it mean to you? And, he, you know, they love the, the cyclone and, and what that throws up. So interesting approach looking at it from that values lens. The other uh, values uh, that values groupings that came to the fore was life uh, and that ability to, they actually all relate the ability to combine work and play. And that was, you know, an elder, a recreational fisher, a commercial fisher, a whale and dolphin charter operator and a marine park officer. 
like for example, Tony, Uncle Tony Hart, you know, we're always around the beach, you know, it was just part of our life. If we got sick or something like that, when we're almost coming good, we always had to smell that ocean or swim in it. Yeah. Um, another uh, relational grouping a values relational grouping was home. So people, if we say, what, is it, what, is this, what does it mean to you? And well, it's my home. Uh, and that of, they often described their home as part of their memories uh, um, and the deep cultural connection. So there was a number of elders that referred to it as home, but also an oyster farmer, dive charter operator, and a research scientist. So it's these very different people from different backgrounds relating to a place um, and valuing a place. Uh, in this similar sense. Uh, and for example, Brian Shanahan, so he was a long-term oyster farmer on the Woolai River. And he said for, for him, well, it's home. And this is going to sound stupid, but I'm a bit like the Aborigines. In, this is me. This is the whole thing. Like I took my granddaughter out the other day to see and said, this is my backyard. It's me and I've just grown part of it. So they, they have this incredible, they all have these incredible connections. Another grouping was spiritual uh, in terms of being sort of inter interconnected with the sand, the salt and the sea. And that was from a diver, dive charter operator, and there was the um, a resident and also the planning officer for the marine park at the time. And that was David Clayton, who was the, um, the planning officer. And he sort of relayed, for me, it's a very spiritual connection. I went through a big part of my life, blood, sweat, tears, you know, the marine park with the relationships with the health. So, yeah, I'm ingrained in the sand along many of the beaches. So this sort of take away two things from that in that he's, um, he leaves a legacy behind. He's very proud of what he's done, but the toll it took um, he you know, was sort of also left on the on the sand as well. So you know, through that interview, it was very clear. It was a very hard time for him in the in the early days. Um, camaraderie was another values relation group, and that was really more so in a small coastal village. And that was um, a commercial fisherman and a recreational fisherman. And it was yeah, um, Ronnie Fuller. Uh, uh, very elderly commercial fisher in the Ocean Hall fishery. For him, it was very clear. And he said, you know, and the part I loved about this place was the fishing with the blokes. You'd fish together, you know, you'd probably only be working, only be five yards apart sometimes, you know, you know, all working in together. It's beautiful. The comradeship was absolutely beautiful. And ah, that's what I miss. I miss it more than anything. So it was really clear that he loved that small coastal village feel and everyone working together. Uh, and then the other three were around natural beauty. Um, there was also biodiversity and protection. Uh, and for example, the natural beauty, it was actually more around the visual amenity and people realizing when they'd spent time away, how important it was to them. Uh, for example, Jerry Hagelstein, you know, it's one of the better parts of the coast. I still appreciate it, still take photos of it when I'm out here, you know, the photos towards the shore, looking at the islands and it's just sort of a nice piece of coastline. I might, I'll keep moving on because there's still a bit to get through, but it just highlights that relational values approach and really getting a feel for the those different, very different lives lived, lived but um, those commonalities and how they value place. And to kind of flip that thinking, the, um, you know, if you're looking at it from the traditional commercial fishing stakeholder grouping, these were the relational values groupings in terms of um, from all of the commercial fishers that I spoke to you know it was Rob Toyer who loved the challenge it was Ronnie loved the com camaraderie uh, there was the natural beauty uh, life uh, and then there was also in the traditional sense you know you probably assume that livelihood is the driving factor and that was for one or two but but not all uh, and then there was another one who uh, really loved the ease of access he'd just roll out of bed and he would be in you know doing his um fishing you know fairly fairly quickly Moving that along. So another uh, benefit to doing oral histories was uh, understanding the special places uh, and uh, there was sort of patterns that emerged so in, from the north to the central to the southern sections of the marine park. So, you know, when asking people, you know, do you have a special place and and unpacking that uh, areas in the north, it was is special to people primarily because it was quite remote. It's surrounded by Uruguay National Park. So there was not a lot of people. Uh, it's fairly pristine. So that was really, you know, why it was special. In the central section, it was 
more so about the the cultural significance uh, and that is an area that's very culturally significant to the Gumbang, Gumbangia people. So the, the photo there is Red Rock uh, and Karindi River, and and that's um, that's a massacre site the, at Red Rock, but it's incredibly uh, important to the Gumbang, Gumbangia people. Uh, and then in the south, the pattern uh, and what people why people would talk about a special place. It's actually more around the sort of the activities and the fun and the and in particular surfing. So it's just interesting that these themes emerged. Uh, but it also looking at the special places and asking that question was giving insights to important places and how they contributed to people's sense of place. And really it could illuminate the social, ecological, cultural, economic, and historical constructs of place for people. And a, a part of it I really loved was the origin of reef names and how they were popularised through time. So, and this was a bit of an add-on as I started the project. Um, I was a little way into it and people were talking about these, you know, the reefs and stories around the reefs. So actually I went back and interviewed a, a couple of fishermen in particular and I took big maps and, and we uh, talked about the um, reef names and stories around how they came to be. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but also, yeah, the, uh, also enabling the um, to understand the relationships of and perceptions of power in places, and again, really probably more so around reefs and if you know if Darcy's reef or it was called Wright's reef, but Darcy Wright, you know, it was kind of his reef, and the fishermen knew that you didn't really go there. So it was these you know unwritten rules in terms of um, power in places. But the origin of reef names, so I've actually I've, I've mapped as many of the reefs as I could with names and stories, and, it, and it's stories that could be lost if we if we don't capture them. You know, we, we re rely on GPS and sounders and all sorts these days, and some of these reef names, you know, they're, they're using landmarks or just to, to look at this, um, the map on the right of the screen. So the, the brown... Uh, patches are the the reefs that are mapped throughout just the northern end of the park. This is only the northern end, uh, and the pink is the sanctuary zone. Yellow is habitat protection zone. Blue is general use zone, uh, and just the smattering of the the reef names there. And just a couple of examples. Uh, so, forty doubles is just near Northwest Rock, uh, which is near North Solitary Island to the right, and so this is. Bob Howard explaining this. So Jude's father, Bill Hargraves, went out there one night in the 1940s and he got 40 doubles of snapper. That's 40, two fish at a time, out there on cord line one night. So this is a really prominent fishing reef and it's called 40 doubles and it's known as 40 doubles and that's the story behind it. And, it, yeah, it's probably not well known, but it's, it's good to have that recorded. Um, another example, uh, you know, the Tuvi ground, the most consistent place would have been what we would have called Tuvi ground, and it was named after one of the fishermen that was here before my time. Uh, it's a gravelly bottom, and it must have been a spawning ground for snapper. So many of the reefs um, that were fished were named after fishermen or, you know, the topography or what you might catch. Uh, and then there's the example of Blue Tang City. So that was named after prominent fish, and that was also and that's at Northwest Rock as well. And the dive charter operator said it's it's chock a block full of blue tangs, and they are you know the biggest ones I've ever seen anywhere in the world actually. So uh, the the dive sites were largely named after fish or topography. There was only one site out of lots that was named after a person, and that was uh, Buchanan's Reef, and that was because they spent a lot of time there. So yeah, just really interesting stories about reefs and people and. Yeah, how, how they were so special and got these names and and kept their names over time. Um, and then the changes over time, and I am running out of time, um, but, yeah, the diversity of the change and, and the drivers of change, you know, obviously um, you, you get that qualitative data to complement quantitative change. Uh, it provides a common ground to engage with community about the change, so uh, and not the government views of change. So if we were highlighting that, you know, the fish um, stocks are not what they used to be if it's coming from government and government research as such, um, fishermen are probably, you know, put the barriers up. Whereas if it's fishermen, these elderly fishermen saying it's not what it used to be, um, it, it's 
more credible perhaps in that you know that through their lifetime they've they've seen that change and they are fishermen sharing that story with other fishermen so that's that is something gleaned from the research uh some really you know beautiful and unusual wildlife occurrences and behaviors and shifts in range were captured and the human dimensions associated with those change like being able to uh, water ski in some of the the these lake coastal lakes uh, and now you you know you, you probably wouldn't even get your knees wet if you walked across them so you know how that impacts people and 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 how they enjoy the coast i'll just i'll touch on one uh, change over time which is really prominent and that was the sea mullet uh, and there was just consistent stories of the decline of the sea mullet uh, just a, a couple of reflections so uncle bing uh, a gumbang gear elder he was sort of the elder of elders um, and the medicine traditional medicine man as well he said yeah when the sea mullet come all big the sea the river just fills up with sea mullet you can nearly walk over the river you can nearly walk on them when the mullet coming in long time ago yeah so uncle bing actually spoke in lingo and I, it was yeah it was beautiful uh, but i did have to uh, have some assistance in transcribing that one from one of the other elders uh, ronnie fuller uh, he was an ocean hall fisherman himself who used to target mullet. And he said, yeah, we used to get hard gut mullet in January, February, sometimes Christmas. Uh, he used to call it Christmas mullet. And today there's none. There's virtually none. It's unbelievable. And this is coming from a person that caught the mullet. <laughs> um, and another, yeah, Eric Bennett, he was talking about how, why he thinks that the mullet, he was a rec recreational fisher, you know, why that there's that decline. And, uh, you know, I reckon the mullet started to seriously get depleted around the 60s. They started these jet boats and God spare me, days when they caught them within a few seconds. I've got heaps of fish in circle. They haven't got a chance with these jet boats, the fish. They're not given a chance to spawn. It's really interesting insights. And I... These were the other sort of species that I touched on as well. You I know, mean, really consolidated some of the stories to tell the story of the snapper, boom and bass, the salmon. This is really incredible stories, and I, I don't have time to go into them, but not only the species, the coastal erosion, sedimentation, and technology. I didn't really expect that to come through. This was a question I asked, you know, what changes have you seen over time, expecting it to be in, you know, the natural setting but yeah a lot of people talked about the technology and how um, like in the beach hall fishery you know that technology really changed things or that's that's the change they'd witnessed or even then recreational fishing or even diving you know the technology with diving so yeah that was that was an interesting insight uh, and then these cross-cutting themes that came to the fore as well. So it's it was about the relationships and trust. So the process of oral history and the participants in it were just as important as the product, if not more important. So it's, and yeah, I really relate to that. It was it was the time with the people and, um, and understanding them and what they value um, were just as important, if not more important than, you know, those, the actual oral histories at the end of it. Um, it's that ongoing communication through time with them through the process and the subsequent liaison and the friendships and the trust and just that working relationship you build from the oral histories. And it really, yeah, it enhanced that relationship and potential past angst or tensions. And, you know, there was some of the uh, recreational fishermen who most vehemently opposed marine parks. I interviewed them and, and it, you know, it, was, it was a good safe space to talk and, and you know, just build on those relationships. Um, and a new way of knowing. So it's this new type of evidence and it's what I'm trying to, you know, bring to the natural scientists. It's, it's, it's really important information uh, and evidence is treated in, in, in a way that it's data, it's, um, it's measured, whereas this is new evidence um, and information uh, and this co-creation of the narratives um, and that's telling the stories is, is really an inf influential way to... Yeah, to change mindsets perhaps uh, and and um, inform management as well. And the, the quantitative and qualitative uh, knowledge is both valuable. And this is a, a picture of a black cod. And this is Darcy Wright. He's a tough character. And so one of my PhD supervisors, Dr. Hamish Malcolm, he is... Um, yeah, he was a research scientist. He had a, you know, he counted the fish. He yeah, had a focus on black cod, and he would monitor this um, protected species and their numbers year after year. And so I was able to contribute to that through memories and stories. And Ron Rigdon, one of the commercial fishermen, 
he said dad or he's talking about his dad got 48 black cod big black cod off it the patch was a reef in the first week and that was 1937 and god they got some fish off it so that's this imagine that like a big slow growing fish and 48 in a week in one reef back in the in 37 so yeah, and there was a, quite a number of stories of um, black cod being caught in numbers and, and size. Just moving along. Oops, sorry. I think I've... I'll go back. Uh, so a new, a new way of sharing as well, which was just beautiful. So we actually... We, uh, we had some artwork commissioned based on some of the stories and some poetry and some music. And we had this exhibition at the art gallery and uh, Barbara Knox, she had this, the funniest story. She said, I'd rode over onto the middle island and I stood on the Jolly Rock and caught it. The next morning I went in this big wave. It was just, the water was just green water and it hit me, knocked me flying. Lucky it was a bit conceited in those days. And I had my head full of rollers, you know, the plastic rollers. And I hit the back of my head and it didn't do anything, didn't crack my skull. So this, this um, you know, picturing this this very strong independent woman who was who you know, had a hard life in this small remote community, went out fishing with rollers in her hair and it really probably saved her life perhaps. So it was a pretty cool story as well. So we had, um, yeah, got that artwork. So a different way to share information. Uh, but it also it enables you to extend that knowledge uh, past, um, or, you know, capture information past where research, you know, commenced essentially. So here in the solitaries, uh, Charlie Veron, I think he published in 1972. So, and that was about the corals and, uh, and the work that they were doing. So really there wasn't a lot of information about the subsurface prior to that. So, you know, insights of spearfishers and divers, you know, in a near pristine environment in you know, the 50s and the 16s before the research commenced, you know, some of those insights into the catches in the 30s. Uh, there were some you know, really interesting stories of how World War II was on the doorstep of the solitaries and, um, you know, barbed wire across some of the, the rivers and on the beaches. Um, it was identifying that sense of place and there was um, stories of uh, First Nations people, you know, had walking tracks to the islands, uh, you know, about 10,000 years ago before the um, last sea level rise and some, you know, insights into the impacts of breakwall construction and, and rail bridges on sedimentation, erosion, et cetera. So it's really, yeah, adding insights. And it also enables us to explore myths. Um, this is Pimpernel Rock, and it sits in 45 metres of water. It's fairly far offshore. Uh, it comes up to 10 metres from the surface, and it's it's in a sanctuary zone. It's just the most incredible, diverse, uh, biologically diverse um, pinnacle in in a in a sort of an offshore environment. There's there's sharks, there's black cod, there's this schooling fish. But there was the myth that it was um, blown, the top was blown off during World War uh, Two, used as target practice. And so we're talking to the el elderliest of um, participants um, and just trying to, you know, is this the case? You know, it was just out of interest. It was just a question. Uh, but Bob Howard, who had been there since '54, said he he always knew it as subsurface. But and um, Alan Johnson also um, said. It, one of his insights was it wasn't marked on any of the maps in earlier times. It wasn't probably till after the war that it got marked on the map, which would lead you to believe that it, it's always been subsurface. So we never got to the bottom of it, but yeah, it was, it was fun sort of exploring that. And it's just adding to the historical record as well um, in terms of, you know, some information like Lola Fuller in many water in this remote community in about 1939. Um, that's when she moved there and she, recollects the sand mining in about 1940 and you know she she loved it you know not many people have this positive association with sand mining but she, we had a good life there and the sand mining was tremendous it was really great to see it there was a lot of men working there the sand mining is one of the loveliest things I've ever seen as they all camped there it was really nice to meet people so this is actually a picture of um her husband and her son to the left, Ronnie Fuller, who I mentioned was the fisherman, so Lola was the mother. But this area in that photo, uh, the the coastal erosion has removed that. That's now sort of under pretty much underwater, or it's certainly not. There's no houses there anymore. So, but it, yeah. So part of this story is that the formal records um, 
a sort of highlight that sand mining commenced in the or occurred there in the 60s and 70s, but she clearly rec recollected it in the 40s. So that's adding to the historic record. Um, and I mentioned exposing gaps in knowledge. I mentioned First Nations uh, and climate change was fairly limited in, in the observations, but the, you know, they were thinking these uh, interviews were conducted um, 2000 and let's say 12 to 16, so a little while ago, where it probably wasn't as as prominent. In, uh, and just a couple more slides. Uh, so the key tips and lessons learned. So this is um, Barbara Knox. She was a commercial beach warmer, beach wormer. So she would catch these really long beach worms and sell them. And she was the one that had the rollers in her hair. So key tips. Um, so establish the focus of your project early if you're embarking on an oral history project. Um, you know, plan well and and for a, for a long journey. Um, release forms and ethics approval are uh, essential. Uh, I ask for photos. I think photos are an amazing um, accompaniment to to the stories. Uh, I got advice from an oral historian with my questions. So yeah, really, you know, reach out to oral historians and and seek their views uh, and advice. Uh, be a great listener at interview and um, just immersed in the stories there was a couple that really you know brought me almost to tears but it was so I was just so immersed in their stories and their passion one was an elder and one was a surfer yeah so different people different stories but just their connection to the park was incredible um go with the flow and co-create um, you know the stories can sort of lead lots of different ways be meticulous with data storage uh, get help with the transcription that's a big part of the project. Uh, these days, I think it's pr you'd probably get it done really quickly through AI or other things. So I actually had people listening and typing. Um, and um, the participant review the transcript uh, and also, you know, be comfortable with that iterative um, in the analysis and the, and the nodes, you know, shifting things around and, and just looking for those patterns and themes and celebrating people's stories. Uh, and just the lessons learned, um, you know, one photo doesn't tell the whole story in the photo album. Similarly, one one story or recollection um, or answer to a question doesn't really tell the whole story of, you know, a person and, and give you an insight. So it's that that, that interview um, really sheds a whole lot of light. You know, so I, you know, I'd ask the question, you know, what does the park mean to you? And they might highlight, you know, in an answer. Um, it might be short, might be long, but then looking at that in the context of the entire interview just gave it a bit more with richness. Um, and you're more immersed in the stories, I believe, if you if you are, if you do the interview. So the other people involved in several of the interviews that undertook the interviews that then I um, re reviewed and used in my PhD. I was probably less connected to those, unfortunately. Like I, I know them and I've used their stories, but I really remember the ones that I sat with and and they you know became part of me, I guess, as well as part of their story. Um, Sixty-five interviews is super ambitious. It's just yeah, it's I don't know if I'd um, encourage that, but yeah, there's a wealth of knowledge there to to unpack. Um, it's a critical point in time for people to record uh, memories uh, and their stories. Uh, and improves relationships with community, as I mentioned, and it really changed me as a manager, you know, just really understanding the people that I was working with and, and why they were so passionate about um, this special place. Um, largely there, just in closing, and this is Charlie Brown. I was so lucky to be able to, to dive with him. He came back. Um, but, you know, it really it's, it enables you to situate people squarely in the story of such an important place. And it was really once only described by its biological and ecological attributes. Um, you know, they're not so not so solitary. You know, the solitary islands have actually been peopled for, for a long time, certainly by Gumbangu people prior to, 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 our, um, to colonial settlers coming as well. Um, but really without understanding humankind by humankind, so the knowledge base upon which to make decisions for a marine protected area is, is incomplete. And these are my acknowledgements. So sorry, I, I did take a little bit longer. Um, that's, there's lots of people involved and some contacts as well. So thank you.
Oh, Nicola, this was fascinating. I mean, I loved hearing these stories. So I can I can only imagine how it was for you living there and, and managing the MPAs to, to the MPA to be hearing all this. Um, so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. With us. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get to all the questions. I'll just pick and choose, but it, it was worth it to hear everything that you described. Um, one question that came up, and I had this question as well, is I'll read a couple versions of it. Um, is the data being incorporated into formal decision making at the park in any way? And someone else asked something similar. How are these oral histories being incorporated in contempor into contemporary management of the MPA? Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, good questions. Um, they, they have been sort of intermittently, but not formally. The, the park, uh, it hasn't been reviewed in quite some time. Uh, and I haven't published anything other than my PhD, and that was only completed, um, uh, it was, yeah, I think it was actually late last year, really, that it, um, or mid last year it was made available. So, uh, and and protected areas in New South Wales really haven't budged, but the the people still working there, I don't, I don't work there anymore, um, have the information. And as I said, it, it, it's been, used in in pieces like particularly the the black cod information was used in some research but it's really now up to me to, to start to publish papers so people can use it um and yeah so I've, in my in the last few years where i've been provided the opportunity to to provide input from a marine park perspective i have but it it, it certainly hasn't been used to the fullest extent it could be um, in the, in recent years. Um, were there any examples of how it may have changed your actions when you were um, managing at the Marine Park? I, I think it just gave me an understanding of how people, um, you know, there's some people I interviewed that I, I probably used to be nervous about interacting with, like some of the recreational fishers who were so opposed to marine parks and they're on the news or to this marine park and on the news all the time but yeah I you know had some really nice conversations and I, I got to understand why they're so passionate about the park and I so it changed my mind set in that you know everyone really values this place for for some reason and it's just trying to find that balance that you know people st still want to be able to interact and and have time in that place for the, you know, with family or for, you know, what gives them joy. Yeah, so it's, it's probably just understanding people better and, and what drives them, I suppose. Um, it's probably the biggest thing for me. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, I'm going to group two other questions together. Um, one was, um, could you elaborate a bit on how you found these themes? And another one was, did you use any specific framework to organize and understand values, whether that was a priori or post hoc? Yeah, so the themes, um, we sort of talked about it when we were designing the project, because it started as a project and then turned into my PhD. So just working with the people in the Marine Park team, I, I sort of knew what I wanted to ask in terms of the questions and it was the experiences you know just understanding you know the joyful experiences and it was probably on the back of that meeting in 2008 when people were re recollecting about the good times we definitely wanted to know about important places and changes over time and and just and the perspectives on management so yeah I, it was probably just yeah the, the very early days what i wanted to understand better and then we did get advice from this um an oral historian to help with the, the questions and the line of questioning and we weren't strict with questions and you know you might just really go into an interview just with three th themes in mind um to ensure that you've captured those and it, it, it just kind of flowed um in terms of the values framework that was super hard for me like um coming so I've come from the quantitative background to qualitative research and I'd try to measure things and you know I'd say okay well you know 15 people said it it means home to me so that must be most important and you know seven people said it was life so I was I was, I was grabbing this it was in relation to a you know a question what does the marine park mean to you so I could grab that story recollection 
or insight and put that into a node. And, and it was just it was really reviewing all of that information and looking for patterns and themes. And I could see these themes emerging. And there's probably no right or wrong sort of theme. And if someone else took all of the information, they'd probably, they might find similar themes for some, but they might find others. Um, but my supervisors just kept reminding me, you don't have to measure measure this. It's, you know, it's there's some things you just can't measure. So, um, so there were just the, the themes that spoke to me. It was my interpretation of their interpretation of of yeah what what the park meant to them. So, yeah, thank you, Nicola. Um, how did you share these stories back with the community? Yeah, um, I ha I haven't. Since I finished, I haven't been able to share them in their entirety, but I would love to, you know, share them through a, a book or, or something else. That was sort of my ambition early on. Um, we did organise this, um, it was an exhibition at the Art Gallery in Coffs Harbour, which is, it isn't big, but it was, it was kind of intimate. And we had the uh, some of the participants there. So we had that artwork. So there was the lino cuts of, uh, there was about eight artworks produced based on stories and then there was a poet who wrote poetry about that story and then um, some music as well so we we shared that with the community in, in that way there was the Bellingen Readers and Writers Festival so we also went to that and and shared some uh, some of the stories there as it was evolving um, and at the museum as well so I was also actually lucky enough to um, publish a, a very short part of the evolution of the marine park in a recent publication, which um, is the Great Ocean Quarterly. So it's this, it's a um, ocean focused magazine. It's not a magazine. It's a, it's a yeah, it's this beautiful um, document that used to be published fairly regularly quarterly now it's not it's just sort of one off but it, it's about arts and um, just beautiful stories and about the ocean so the, the evolution of the marine parks in that and that's that's um so I've got that got sort of national sort of broadcast there but yeah still lots to do I yeah I've started a new job so I <laughs> don't know when I'll be able to share more yeah Yes, I think we can all understand uh, that, but we hope that uh, there there are ways um, at some point. Uh, it's, it's fantastic stories. Um, let's see. There were certain questions about why do you think um, women were more, or sorry, a lot of the female respondents were reluctant to participate. And do you think the results would have looked differently had they been had more um, participated? Yeah, it, it probably would look different and the um sort of the insights but the the people that we contacted uh in the first instance it was probably you know a list of about 40 and it was people that we'd interacted with day to day through marine parks and and you know marine management and those activities were probably more so traditionally male um you know including you know not only the fishing industry clearly but you know surfing was probably more male dominated at that time you know we've come a long way in a short space of time um the research and diving it was just probably just a more male dominated area and and it was probably you know some of the the wives that came along to the interviews they um they, you know they would often say i don't really have much to share um there was no i can't remember i don't think there was a female that declined to participate it was just they really yeah there didn't seem to be as many to to contact to, to invite their participation but certainly there was yeah many most of them were divers some researchers uh and um you know barbara she was a, she was a commercial fisher she was the wife of a commercial fisher so yeah there's so many different perspectives that could you know could be part of the story if, if i was able to find more females to participate but it was just yeah it's just how it evolved and I didn't go into the project looking for gender balance in any way it was just yeah the people that have um yeah been part of the marine park story that I knew okay thank you so much Nicola um we have some other really great questions here and I'm sorry that we aren't able to get to them um but uh, I will be able to provide them to Nicola so she will see them um thank you so much this was just beautiful work it's wonderful to see and i i hope we can get there to have similar um similar resource and stories for 
for all MPAs. It's um, it's a wonderful thing to have to know those histories and uh, see how they could influence um, to, to better understand the history and um, influence current and future management. Um, Nicola, thank you so much for sharing this with us. We, we really appreciate you making yourself available um, to share this with us. And it was much enjoyed based on the comments we're getting. Um, so again, and thank you to everyone who participated through your questions in the chat and putting in resources. Um, we really appreciate that. And um, we hope that you're able to join us on future webinars and learning. And um, Nicola's con uh, contact information is shared in case this is work you can take up in your own MPA. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah.